devil seeking to devour. With trembling hearts we hear his roar, but your strong arm will crush his power. We look to you. Suffering, it won't be long. It won't be long. Storm tossed pilgrim, if you're struggling, it won't be long. It won't be long. Though your flesh is now decaying. Appearing, it won't be long. No, it won't be long. Tears will vanish when we see him. It won't be long. It won't be long.
To judge the living and the dead Usher in the age to come Let everyone sing Amen Jesus will come back again Judge the living and the dead
Oh, wow. Lights, camera, action. Yep, yep, yep. All right, we're going to get started with our final session, so please come on in and find your seat. All right. So this... Uh, this last bit here is got to be some rapid fire Q and A. Okay. So I'm gonna direct questions to whichever guy I think is best gonna be more e dealing with this based upon what you guys presented, how you split up the conference subject matter. So if you need to defer, you can just say, "Hey, I'll pass to my brother Howard." You want to work that out? <laughs> yeah, my brother Howard. Uh, Morgan Freeman says the way to stop racism is to stop talking about racism. Wrong. Is this okay? There we go. That was. <laughs> I mean, that was... It's rapid fire. Rapid fire, yeah. yeah. It was uh, okay, a little less rapid fire. Is this even, is this even is that possible? Right, is that right, rapid fire enough for you? Yeah, uh, is, is this even possible? It is a biblical concept to say that. And how, why is that wrong? It's wrong because it's a moralistic approach to it. Um, so the second question, if it's even possible, is a, is a non-starter because in the beginning, it's a moralistic approach to solving the, the issue. Uh, uh, so what, what Morgan Freeman's uh, approach doesn't recognize is to corrupt human nature. Uh, uh, we've been talking about this now for two days, so he doesn't factor in the biblical anthropology of what's in the human heart. So stop talking about it doesn't mean you stop thinking about it and you stop uh, that, that, the, that the desire, that, that the uh, hateful uh, desires of the heart aren't there. I mean, Martin Luther tried the same thing when he uh, went through all sort of uh, methods of asceticism when he was a, a Catholic before the Lord opened his eyes to the truth of the scripture he tried to uh, uh, he you know he used a cat and nine tails against himself he tried to uh, uh, you know put himself off into a monastery and hide away from the real world but he realized that his he couldn't run from his sinful nature he realized that that was impossible to do so to take a moralistic approach to racism um, is a, it's a, it's a non-starter because it doesn't deal with the root cause of it in the beginning. Uh, so they're not talking about it accomplishes absolutely nothing toward that. So if we were to, would it be more biblical or accurate to say if we stopped inventing racial grievances out of whole cloth and stopped re-problematizing everything for the sake of a narrative, that much of the conflict that we deal with in our day-to-day -day America would cease to exist? No, uh, it wouldn't because here's the thing. I have to sort of exegete your question a little bit, Jim. Because again, what, what, what I talked about earlier today, when I tried to walk you through what the Bible says in terms of love, hate, love, hate, love, hate, versus isms, phobias, and the, the terms that the culture uses, uh, a born-again believer, as we made clear as I was walking you through some of those passages in 1 John, a born-again believer isn't going to desire to re-problematize these issues to begin with. So you have to separate your question in, into two groups. How do believers handle these issues, and then how do unbelievers handle them? Mm -hmm. So a believer is going to handle the issue biblically. They're not going to desire to re-problematize the issue. They're going to take you to the scriptures. Number one, as Virgil pointed out, as we've said often on, on our podcast, that the Bible is both a mirror and a window. Mm -hmm. A believer is going to hold that mirror up to themselves, first of all, before they hold that, flip it around and, and turn it into a window to see everybody else. But a, a believer is not going to go that route. And I think it's ironic in that <clears throat> the culture will say, yeah, we want to solve these issues. We want to resolve these issues. So they see them as issues. But that's the problem. They see them as issues. They don't see them as sins. <clears throat> so until you see these issues as sins, you're going to, you're going to it's, it's like we quoted from J.C. Rao, you're going to be content with wrong and imperfect remedies. And this is what Morgan Freeman doesn't understand. He, with all due respect, dude's got a crazy voice, one of the best narrators <laughs> uh, uh, to, to, to ever live. But he doesn't understand. He's, he's, he's fallen into that trap that J.C. Rao talked about. He's He's applying a, 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 an insufficient um, 
imperfect, moralistic remedy to what's a spiritual problem. And as Virgil made clear today, only the gospel is the solution to that. All right, since he went too long, I'm going to give this one to you and let you speak on, on his behalf, all right? This is an excerpt from October 2020, article written by John MacArthur, quote, Today the evangelical swamp is chock full of charlatans, heretics, socialists, Marxists, and race hustlers. Yes! Please, yes. There is nothing truly and biblical evangelical about it. Should we abandon the term evangelical in favor of a more accurate term? You, you didn't know that was where that was going, did you? No. Okay, so let me back that up. That took a twist. Like, yeah. where? Okay, so the, the evangelical movement, the evangelical swamp is chock full of charlatan, heretic, socialists, and Marxists, and race hustlers. Is the answer then to abandon the term evangelical I mean, or to, to reveal the charlatans, heretic, socialist, Marxist, and racist? No, I, 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 I mean, I, one of the things that I, that I love about MacArthur's ministry, which is why I was overjoyed, was he's willing to say that the first step is to be able to identify, to say, and admit that there are, you know, sharks and evil people who are lurking about, desiring to devour the flock of God. That was kind of what I shared in the last part of my message. We've got to be willing to say that to begin with. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and then to examine what evangelicalism is or has become as a result. Uh, I understand looking at evangelicalism, seeing what's taken place, and wanting to move away from uh, the idea. That's exactly what, uh, what, what Praise Mill did regarding the SBC. Uh, we saw the swamp that it is, and we made a decision. We were going to remove ourselves because it wasn't worth spending the time and energy. Try we, we weren't commissioned for the purpose of saving the SBC. Right? We're commissioned to go and share the gospel. So we removed ourselves from that. I don't see anything pragmatically wrong with doing that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do one or the other. I would do a both and. Mm. If, if I were to move away from that term uh, in, in favor of, of a different term, I would all the, along the way tell you who the sharks were, who the, who, wh what the swamp was made up of, and who was actually in it. So I'd, I'd have, I wouldn't have a problem if we're doing both and. All right. What ripples, if any, does CRT, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, have outside the United States? Daryl. <clears throat> That's a good question. I think um, one of the things you need to understand about Black Lives Matter is, and, and you heard this if you listen to our episode, first of the two episodes that we did on Black Lives Matter, titled Black Lives Matter with a question mark. Their roots seem to be uh, primarily national, meaning they're, they're, they're pretty much rooted here in the United States. Uh, but even as far as that goes, the Black Lives Matters at a national level, they are not, and I think this is interesting for us to point out on the episode, they are not a nonprofit organization. They are not officially a 501c3 organization under the IRS. And I think it's interesting how they've structured themselves in that what they've done is that they've got this, this uh, big umbrella of a national organization, but what they've done is that they've taken an, an advantage of an IRS loophole that allows them to align themselves with sub-organizations that are 501c3s yes. so that the donations that they take are funneled through these sub-organizations, not to them. So you, you, you really find it difficult to track where the money comes from and where the money's going. <clears throat> I don't know what type of footprint Black Lives Matter has internationally. Uh, to whatever footprint that may have existed outside the United States, I think that footprint is now crumbling based on recent news uh, that's come out about how, especially P Patrice Colors, who's the, the, the former leader, now she's resigned from Black Lives Matter. They are losing uh, leaders at the national and local level left and right. Uh, now that these revelations have come to the fore about how they've actually been spending the tens of millions of dollars that they've been um, uh, compiling over the years. Uh, but we haven't really, I'll, I'll say this for you, I don't know about you, V, I won't speak for you, but I haven't really studied Black Lives Matter outside of the United States because the impact uh, that they've been having have been primarily domestically in urban cities around the country. So my attention has been here as it relates to BLM <clears throat> as opposed to somewhere else. Nothing to add to that? I'm trying to be rapid fire. Okay, so. good. <clears throat> All right, so we had somebody ask about why evangelical leaders have adopted CRT uh, and been permissive on this. Um, let's drop some bombs for a second. Let's name some names. This is a stage where a lot of names get named mm -hmm. because, um, well, we have a crippled guy who gets up here and just like names people's names all the time. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's name some names. Drop some bombs. Don't be reserved. Tell us who the charlatans, the hucksters, the race hustlers are. Uh, within the evangelical movement. It seems like we have evangelical leaders who wake up on Sunday morning with their David French under ruse 
and they <laughs> sip their free trade coffee with soy milk in it, and they wait for the latest David French uh, column to drop, and then to see what Tim Keller says about it, and they're just fanboying all the wrong people. Yes. What's going on in evangelicalism with the Gospel Coalition, <clears throat> with the Together for the Gospel? Yeah. Who are the people who are leading the woke push in these once reliable evangelical institutions? Yeah, I, I think... I think uh, this is for both of you, yeah. so chime in. I'll, I'll start out by saying that the, the, the seminaries primarily are where we're seeing the biggest push in the problem. Um, SBC seminary presidents have, have all jumped on the woke train. I think the, the, Al, Al Mohler is probably one of, the, one of the last that has, at least lately, remained silent on the issue. I think, I think he's picked places to say things uh, that make sense to those who are conservative. He's, he's conservative enough uh, so that he's not making big waves about the issue, but he's not taking clear stands, naming specific names, getting the people who are, who are in his seminary who are promoting these ideas out of the seminary by recognizing that they're doing great damage uh, to the body of Christ. You mentioned the, the, the t- Tim Kellers of the world who've been compromised, the, the, uh, the, the, the um, Mark Devers who have been, I mentioned the Matt Chandler and, and his ideas are around these issues. All of those men have involved themselves to some degree in a, in a push around social justice, believing that it is the right thing for us to embrace, that these are the kinds of ideas that, that are important. I think when you mentioned uh, uh, the Gospel Coalition, I mentioned yesterday that, that, that that's a whole rebranding. They're rebranding themselves. Uh, in such a way as to appear to be uh, the, the, the nice middle of the road. T4DG is no more. That's over. So all the push is toward uh, the Gospel Coalition and what they offer. But they're, again, a, a compromised organization on this issue. I could go back, whether, whether it was the, the promotion of men like Thabiti on uh, whether it was the, the articles that, that are written on their, on, their, in, on their social media pages, and they have a massive, massive audience. All of those things are problematic, and people don't understand that they're that they're drinking down poison when they engage in, in some of the content from those sites. And so those are the people I think to, be, to watch out for. T, TCG is recognizing that when, when soccer moms show up at, uh, you know, at, at, at school board meetings to talk about CRT, there's a recognition that something's wrong. And it didn't take a guy like, like Daryl or me who's studied this stuff. They just know that they don't want their kids listening to it. So if an organization is going to embrace it to the thing that Daryl has been saying for quite some time, you can't walk in and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm CRT. You've got, to, you've got to restructure it. So what they've done now is it's been, it's been, it's been shrouded under the umbrella of, of niceness. Well, we've got people on this side who are good people and people on that side who are good people. And what we need to do is figure out a way to talk nicely about this. And so that's the rebranding of it all. Is the dissolution together for the gospel uh, due to becoming woke? Is it a go woke, go broke type of a thing? Are they losing followers for that reason? I, I would argue yes. But if you notice the last, uh, th- their last meeting together, they tried to, they tried to stand like they, you know, like, they, like they stood where we are standing now. Like at the end of it, you, know, you had people making statements and making proclamations and claims, and they were really ready to, to unpack and examine uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> social justice and the social gospel. But it was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was too little too late after the fact. And so that's kind of where things landed. So a lot of these men that you've named, uh, Al Mohler, for instance, Mark Dever, they would like to, and they were known up until a couple of years ago as uh, keynote speakers at Shepherd's Conference. I was there a couple of years ago when the whole Q&A broke up. Mm-hmm. Uh, broke up. Um, these guys were platformed by some of our trusted evangelical leaders for years, yes. and it seems as if they wanted to be known as standing with you guys on this issue, with MacArthur on this issue. They wanted to be seen as being included in that camp, mm-hmm. and yet would it be fair to say that men like Albert Moeller did not spend the political capital that they had in order to fight back against it? That they wanted to position themselves as, yes, I agree with the conservative base on this, they weren't willing to stand up and go to bat against it at a time when the church needed those men to stand up and to draw those lines. And if those lines had been drawn prior to 2019, you wouldn't have had a resolution in the SBC on, on, on that issue of critical race theory. You wouldn't have had people in the SBC pushing that. Instead, you would have had those lines being drawn and people falling out on both sides of that. And this healthy division, which should come as a result of this, would have already happened and you could have had an opportunity to push the wolves out before they got a hold of the, the throat of the sheep. I think this is an example of what I just discussed regarding a shepherd 
protecting the sheep. What you just stated is exactly what needed to be done, what needed to be said, uh, and, and has been said by all the people that, that, aren't, you know, that aren't on the other side of that. I think the, the book Fault Lines did a fantastic job of laying out who was on which side of the ideological lines regarding these issues. All the things that you said are right, true, and correct. Had these men, rather than being comfortable sharing pulpits and platforms for the purpose of politics uh, and, their own, and their own platform growth, uh, if they would have stood on the issue saying the hard things when they were hard to say. Now they're willing to say some of the uh, hard things because it's easy to say. It's obvious to everyone where these issues are and what, what it, uh, where, where they should stand. So they're doing so, again, from a pragmatic position. Hey, it's smart to say the right thing now, so I'll step up and say those kinds of things. I'll, I'll, I'll take a step further and say this. In the days to come, what you'll end up seeing, because of the silence from these men, some of them that we've named, what you'll begin to see over the course of time is, is, is groups, organizations, platforms being, being rebranded to bring them back into the fold. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to see uh, the, 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 the owl molders be brought back, dusted off, and pushed out as, hey, these, these guys, we, we need to bring these men in. And oh, my, they were with us all the time. Yeah, they've been yeah. with us all the time. They had, to, they had to navigate their own cultural environment in specific ways. They had to navigate their issues in a contextual way. And now it's time for us to, to bring them back in and, and understand that they've been with us all along. When my, my stance on that, on that position would simply be they made, they, they made public uh, uh, proclamations about these issues, and they need, to make, they need to be publicly repenting with regard to those issues as well. Yeah, they were going to be gaslit into thinking that these men were taking nuanced <coughs> positions Absolutely. in the moment, and really they were with us even though we didn't, it didn't seem like or look like they were with us. We get uh, some criticism sometimes that we are uh, we admire John MacArthur way too much in our church. Sure. You know, people say, oh, you guys are just too hard. I mean, we, the second grace to you uh, employee that we've had here in a row. Um, one of the things that I've admired about John MacArthur, and this is not just a fanboy out about John MacArthur, is that when we have needed him to, and evangelicalism has needed him to, he has taken the public stand, the right stand at the right time, and has been unbending on it in the moment mm -hmm. at, the, at the vanguard, at the front of when that is needed. And at times, as, jo as Justin has pointed out in a recent interview that he did with John, these stands that he has taken has cost him friendships with Absolutely. some of these men that you have named. Absolutely. And yet John has stood unwavering on those issues, and he has done so sometimes to the detriment of his own reputation in the larger evangelical community. Absolutely. And yet he's been right every time. Absolutely. On every fight that we've needed him to fight, he's been there, been the man fighting it Absolutely. in the moment. Absolutely. And sometimes Absolutely. looking behind him and... When people say, I'm there. behind you all the way, and you and look in the way behind you, not even, not even close. <clears throat> all right, define uh, race. You said race is a myth, right. and ethnicity is real, but I've always thought the two are synonyms. No. How are they different? They're different, as you heard me explain this morning and yesterday as well. Um, uh, they're different in that race is a social construct. It's a, move, it's a moving target. It's a moving goalpost. Race is nothing. Really, when you look at it, race is nothing because it, anything, any term that can mean anything means nothing. If a term can mean anything, it doesn't mean anything. So when we speak of ethnicity, you're, when you say ethnicity, you're talking about skin color. No. No. No, it's just the opposite. When the, when the, when the culture uses the word race, they're talking about skin color. Primarily. Think about this, think about this for a second. <clears throat> um, when you want to go to, uh, you see uh, Ancestry.com or 23andMe commercial on television. So yeah, I want to go get a, uh, I want to get a, get, get a, a trace on my ancestry and find out what's going on. They don't ask you to send in a snippet of your skin. <laughs> do they? They don't do that, do they? No. You have to either give a sample of your blood or a sample of your saliva. That which lines up with what we know from Leviticus, where it says the life is in the blood. They don't, you don't go take a graft of your skin and send it in to Ancestry.com. They put it under a microscope and say, hmm, yeah, your ethnicity is, well, it's zero because your ethnicity has nothing to do with your skin color. That's how, ra that's how the culture defines race, though, primarily in terms of the color of your skin. Now, that's where it starts. But as you heard me talk this afternoon and also yesterday, race in the culture can mean anything now. Mm -hmm. Anything. Okay, whereas according to Acts 17, 26, and then Genesis 11 as well, biblically, your ethnicity is who you are in your blood. In your blood, that's who you are. Matter of fact, we just found out, 
I'm going to embarrass Melissa. I'm going to put on a spot right here. We just found out, what was it, last week? Just last week. Melissa got her results back from Ancestry.com DNA uh, genealogy uh, assessment. And you know what? She is 81% African. This is a stereotypical view of race that says, wait a minute, her skin's not dark enough to be 81% African. Are you, are you kidding? Yeah, 81% Nigeria. But see, if you look at the culture's construct of race, you say, absolutely not. Or your skin's too light. You can't be, your ancestors can't be from Nigeria. Well, it's 81%. So again, this is why you have to reject that term, that vernacular, in the, in the context in which the culture uses it, because it doesn't mean anything. Not only is it wrong, as you heard me quote, from Dr. Gloria, uh, Gloria Lance Billings this, this afternoon, even she acknowledged that race has no scientific basis. So it's nothing. Ethnicity is what we are. We are one human race, and by the way, the word race in scripture is translated to mean a type. A genus is the Latin word, a genus, a type. We are one type of, of creation that God has created in his image. So when you see the word race in scripture, that's the context of that. It does, has nothing to do with how the culture uses that word today. Uh, as CRT, via force from the government, continue to put pressure on the traditional Christian family, do you think that abortion agencies will now not only have to fight on faith issues, but also restrict child placement based on skin color, regardless of the needs or merits uh, or the fit for the children? That's, that, I mean, there's a lot there. Help me. That's a yes or no question. That's a, oh. I'm sorry. I was going to go. Uh, it was a yes or no question, wasn't it? I was going, it? yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a yes, V. Okay, good. <laughs> there was a lot there, and I was trying to parse it out as you went, and I'm going, what in nah, the that's world? That's a yes, bro. Okay. <laughs> So you, you think that that's, that, that's going to continue to be a thing? CRT is going yeah. to work its way into adoption yeah. agencies? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. See, yes, it will, everywhere. Absolutely. There's All no right. doubt about that. And you, you think that uh, adoption agencies are going to want, of course, diversity. They're going to want uh, black children being raised by white homes, white children being raised by black homes? No. Mm -mm. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. no. Not that kind of diversity? Not that kind of diversity. No. All right. No. Can you clarify how SEL in schools is bringing CRT Marxism into the schools and discuss how a Christian teacher can address these issues with students. Yeah, so SEL, as it relates to Marxism, again, number one, just a reminder that if you see SEL either abbreviated or social emotional learning spelled out, you need to have your antenna up. You need to have your antenna up because what it's doing is, number one, it has nothing to do, the, the, the term social emotional learning has nothing to do with social emotions or learning. <laughs> has nothing to do with that. What it is, is a covert effort to indoctrinate your children to, uh, to hate America, to ha as I said yesterday, to hate you as their parents, and to embrace uh, anti-authoritarianism, starting with rejecting your parental authority, rejecting your Christian bil uh, biblical worldview that you're trying to bring your children up in, rejecting the Western Judeo-Christian value, rejecting as I said earlier today, all kind of even rudimentary tenets such as um, universal principles of math, universal principles of how to speak proper grammar. Yeah. It's all of this thing. It's all of sort of a Marxian dialectic to get your children indoctrinated into a hate-filled worldview where everything that exists around them today, they hate it. They hate it. It has nothing to do with social, emotional, or learning. It has nothing to do with any of that. So as far as a Christian uh, who is... Um, a teacher was a Christian teacher. A Christian teacher in a, school. A Christian teacher in public schools. Mm -hmm. um, um, you, you, how do you address it with children? The children. You, yeah. Oh. How do you address it with the children in the school? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's that, that's tough. That's tough uh, because the, the thing with SEL is that you're so restricted in what you can say to the children. Um, you can only follow whatever the lesson plan is that that the public school system has developed for you to teach. Um, so, um, what I, my counsel would be this, uh, because even in a broader sense, uh, Christians in any work environment right now, you're going to face decisions that you're going to have to make that are very tough. Mm -hmm. um, because the goal is to ultimately remove any Christian influence from yeah. any of these institutions. That's ultimately the goal. But how a Christian teacher might respond to that, um, is number one, stand strong on your Christian beliefs. Uh, do not waver. Virgil talked about this earlier about how you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. But how you address it with children, 
that's a very fine line you have to walk because in the classroom, they're your students. You do not want to usurp the parental authority of the parents of those children who are your students. Um, so what I would do, I would try to network with the parents of those children outside the classroom. Uh, meet them at a restaurant for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Get a network going on, get, get them all together on a Zoom call uh, or something like that so that you can educate those parents on what you're being required to teach their students so as to keep them abreast of what that content is. Um, obviously, I would... Uh, um, um, uh, attend church regularly and dialogue with those parents. Uh, there's a lot you can do outside the classroom to, uh, to fight against that indoctrination. Uh, but I would say, as it relates to your Christian witness, you don't want to be an obnoxious, sort of uh, purposely defiant person and making trouble on the, on, the, on the school property. But I think there's many things you can do outside of that classroom. Um, but that's, all that's not to say that the Lord may convict you. I'm, I say may. I don't know that this is going to be the case for you, but the Lord may convict you that what you're being required to do is so in violation of your biblical principles that you may end up having to leave. You may end up having to leave uh, that occupation. And many teachers are having to do that uh, today. My, my, my answer was going to be much shorter. I was just going to say get out. <laughs> That's what people have been saying about the SBC for a long time. I so <laughs> Bro. <laughs> this dude right here, man. <laughs> Virgil, this one's for you. Okay. Do you change up your message or approach when you speak to a mostly black community? No. You'd say the same thing in the same way that you did to us today. Absolutely. <laughs> man. We're probably, we're probably even more amped up if we're in front of a black audience. I, I, I would say the same words. There may be a little more passion about it than, than otherwise, but yeah. I, I, I wouldn't change anything that, that I've said. I, I, in fact, Daryl and I t would, would love more opportunities to be in front of predominantly black audiences if they would have us. Uh, I, I'm not partial. They won't we, have us. They, won't, they have us. won't have us. That's the problem. I, they won't, they and, won't and have that, us. And, and, I, and I'm not, I, I told you last night, neither of us are trying to build platforms for ourselves that we're asking to be on, you know, on, on someone's platform. We're available to whoever asks us to come. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would probably, I would probably uh, be probably more passionate about it because I, because the, because I recognize that, that there's so many who, who don't get the kinds of things that we are sharing. Uh, most of them, many of them are in environments where uh, they're, 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 they're exposed primarily to some form of black liberation theology, whether they recognize it's, it's called that or not. Most churches, predominantly black churches, not, and again, don't hear me say that there are no good black churches. I'm simply saying that the predominance of churches uh, are, are, are either teaching some form of a prosperity gospel uh, that's attached to it in some form of, uh, of social justice. I'll give you a quick example and, 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 uh, and, and get back to the rapid fire. When, when uh, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson uh, was, uh, was, was being uh, uh, examined, right, when she was going through her, her process of examination and uh, was being asked by the Senate uh, the different questions, uh, the question that she was asked was, had everything to do with what a woman was, or, 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 or honest questions about, uh, about her, her judicial philosophy. Um, black churches on Sunday were actually preaching about Katanji Brown Jackson and telling their congregants that what she was facing was simply white systemic oppression and racism. That was their Sunday morning service. Uh, over and over and over again, we saw video after video after video of, of this is the diet, the spiritual diet that is being fed to predominantly black churches in many instances. Not all, not all, not all, but in many. And V, if those of you who follow me on Twitter were following me in, uh, during the course of those examinations of Katanji Brown Jackson, I told you two weeks in advance what was going to happen. I sure did. I, I told you two weeks in advance that once, she, once, she gets, once she's done with her confirmation, watch these black church pulpits sermonize those, uh, those hearings and make it all about her and, and how her hearings are symbolic of the struggle that black Americans have had in this country for 300 years. Yep. We were at an airport on a, on a trip back when we heard the news that, that, that she was nominated. And, and I was sitting with Daryl as we had this very conversation 
about how all of the charges, if you asked her a question, <clears throat> it was going to be identified as racist. Anyway. Yep. Hmm. All right. If the CRT movement proceeded unhindered, <clears throat> how would it ultimately end? Not spiritually, which was in, in hell, but in the physical world. What does this physical world look like? What's the end result? What's the goal of CRT? Yeah, there's no end result. The end result for CRT is to not end it. Uh, the end result of CRT, people ask us this question all the time, what's the payoff for CRT? Well, the, the, there's no payoff. It's the, to constantly the, get paid. Pay on, it's the, to re-problemize the bingo. next problem. It's to, it's to find the next victim class. Find the next it's problem. To it's to identify the next problem for, for this to constantly go right. on and on and on. It's right. a perpetual cycle to, to, to nothingness, right. to utopia, a, a nowhere place. That is the whole point and purpose of it. So it's designed for that purpose. It's to deconstruct the Judeo-Christian worldview that built the United States of America for the purpose of their own uh, financial benefit, uh, and which they, 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 there won't be enough of. It'll, it'll be a, a constant monster. This was, I mean, this was happening with the, with the first uh, civil rights leaders after, after King, right? Uh, Jesse Jackson and, and Sharpton. Sharpton and the like. Well, did, did that stop? No, it morphed into what we're seeing now, which is worse than they were. Like the folks who are doing what they're doing now, the, 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 the others had nothing to do. I mean, there, there's no comparison. There hundreds of millions of dollars have poured into the, to, to the coffers of, of uh, Black Lives Matter. It, that, that, the, the, what, what Jackson and others had were pennies compared to what's taking place now. And you recall that when in my last message I quoted from Dr. Elizabeth Last Quinn from her book Race Experts, where she made the point that coming out of the civil rights era in the 60s, into the 60s, going into the 70s, one of the reasons we, that we got here is because you had woke critical race Marxist legal scholars who filled a void that was left after the, after the 70s uh, passed with the critical legal studies movement. So what's going to happen is once this current generation of critical race theorists is gone, there's going to be another wave will looking to fill that void. So it's going to be cyclical. It's not going to end. If it ever gets into a, a foothold into American culture, they're going to do whatever it takes to retain that foothold. Mm -hmm. So whatever is required right now to get rid of white people, because that's the goal, is to get rid of white people, get rid of their influence in to subjugate Western them Judeo, in every way, to subjugate them. whatever way, shape, or form they can. That's the goal. And the goal is to keep it like that. So there is no end to critical race theory. So in CRT theology, if you want to call it that, there really is no room for actual forgiveness, no room for actual atonement. No. It's a perpetual grievance state, and it's a perpetual pursuing this thing that is a, it's a, it's a mist, it's a cloud, it's always it's outside right. of your grasp. That's right? why I said it's a stealth ideology. It's like what I quoted from Booker T. Washington yesterday in his book, My Larger Education. He says a group of race hustlers. This is exactly what these are, race problem solvers is what he called them. They're race problem solvers that re-problem Reproblematize. So when they get what they want from one reproblematized issue, they find another one Absolutely. to bring into the contemporary culture so they can get what they want from that. Then they find another one to bring that in. And this is what you're, happen you're seeing happening right now with DEI, where most of those positions are going to black females. You're seeing it happen with uh, um, uh, ethnic studies, where uh, in, uh, in public school system, one public school system after another, you're seeing... Uh, uh, black teachers and administrators being able to teach that America's racist, that white people are racist, that even your parents are racist, your parents don't want the best for you, your, your parents are liars. So they're getting everything they want, and after they get one thing, they re something else to get something else from them. Yeah, with, with regard to CRT, the original sin is whiteness. Uh, there, there's, no, there's no repentance, there's penance that you can pay. The, 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 the works-based righteousness that... that, that uh, that people are to engage in the anti-racism that people are to engage in is never for the for the purpose of, of making that that person righteous or seeing them come into the fold. They only have to continue to to pay that penalty uh, in an effort to maintain their 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 status as an anti-racist, not as a as, as a person who's now in the fold of those who are woke. Uh, but no, but 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 the person who needs to continue anti-racist works in an effort to maintain some form of of of, of really servitude. That's the intent. It's never to bring one in. That's never the so, that, so while they talk about racial reconciliation, really, there's, there's, they're not aiming for racial reconciliation. Mm -hmm. That's no. a high word. Racial reconciliation no. can never actually happen. No, that's and to they use to it. make that, that, that. Those words are used to pull the strings of, of white guilt for the purpose of fueling the next thing that they want to push forward. And, and pulling, can, pulling those strings has worked so effectively. Matter of fact, it's the pulling of those emotional strings that made Black Lives Matter power, as powerful as they are. You know who, who, who you can blame for Black Lives Matter having the influence that they have? You can blame white, white liberals. Yes. Because it's white liberals who caved. 
It's white liberal, liberals individually and corporate, corporate executives who caved to the pressure, the, the emotional narratology of Black Lives Matters. They caved, and then they started donating one after another, just lining up like they're at a fast food drive through donating $10 million, $8 million, $20 million. I could name some companies, B of A, McDonald's, Amazon. You could go on and on. Uh, I, I think by the time we dropped our two Black, uh, Black Lives Matters episode, I think we had totaled up close to $200 million that BLM had, had been committed just from corporate donors, not just individual donors. But if you want to blame BLM, you want to blame one group for enriching BLM and making them so influential in society today, it's for white liberals. Yeah. Those white liberals that did it. Reconciliation can never actually happen because they, they can never admit that the races are finally reconciled. Here's the problem though, Jim. This, the, 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 that's a presuppositional statement. That's a pre Listen, Virg, here we are, two black guys in a room with what, a couple hundred white people, mm -hmm. uh, am, I, am, am I at a place of discordant relationship with any of you? Totally debunks the idea of racial reconciliation right there. So it's presuppositional. It's, presupp it's put to you as if it's a fact, it's a reality, it's a collective reality. So you guys are white and I'm black, and by virtue of you being white and I'm black, then there must be some kind of rec reconciliation that needs to happen. I haven't stolen a single white person's wallet in this room. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't cursed anyone. I haven't cursed anyone. I haven't offered any sort of ethnic epithet towards anyone. There's nothing to be reconciled between me and you. So you have, if, there's no, if there's no disruption of conciliation, what need is there for reconciliation? There's not. So you, so you need to reject that presupposition because it's presuppositional. And what I want to encourage you to do is something I alluded to yesterday. Don't be afraid to reject that mess. <laughs> Don't be afraid to reject that mess. Don't be afraid to respond to questions with other questions. Put the onus, put the heat back on them. This whole idea of racial, racial, racial reconciliation, it, it's just... It's just dumb. It's stupid. It's, it's condes nothing. It's condescending. I mean, it's real, I mean, there's a whole lot more I can say about it. And can, can I say one more thing? Yeah. See, see, as you deconstruct this idea of racial reconciliation further, what the narrative is is that racial reconciliation, the very concept of it, only has relevance as it relates to two people who are two, of two different ethnicities. But when you look at the idea organically, racial reconciliation also should apply to two people who are of the same ethnicity. If you're really talking racial reconciliation in a pure form, it also applies to me and Virgil. Yes. Why should racial reconciliation only apply when, it, when, it, when you're talking about people of different ethnicities? So again, you have to think these things through, and the more you think about them, the more you realize, man, that's pretty stupid, that's pretty dumb. So, but but it's, it's, it's really easy to deconstruct when you really take the time to think logically through it. So racial reconciliation doesn't apply to two people of the same ethnicity, but it should. So you should ask the question, well, why doesn't it apply to you two? And then you get them in the, in the uh, again, the presuppositional assumptions again. Well, you, you two are both black. What problem do you have with one another? You see how stupid that is? So they rule us out because we're the same ethnicity. They impart to each of our hearts that we don't have issues with one another. Now, we don't. But that's the, that's the kind of assumptions that they make uh, subjectively, uh, because it, th this doesn't fit the narrative, but this does. It doesn't fit the, this fits the agenda, this doesn't. Right. Uh, another question that's kind of related to that, what does the Marxist CRT LGBTQ eschatological end state look like according to their views? And what, who's in charge, what does that utopia eschatological vision look like? And I think we kind of talked about that, that there is no action. We did. It, it's nebulous. It's, it's, it's for the arbitrary convenience of the person positing the idea. Whoever wakes up and thinks that they've got an advantage in a certain circumstance or situation, I'm, th there's, there's no cabal where, where, where they're meeting to, to figure out whose form of utopia is going to be advanced. That's not what's happening. What, what's happening is I'm black. I'm in a situation at work that I can see an advantage where if I cry <clears throat> racism or I cry you know, the, the, the systemic oppression, I can have something advantage to me. And so I leverage it in that situation. That's more of what's taking place than anything else. So, so it's, not this, it's, not, it's not as organized as you might think it is in some ways. In other ways, it's very organized. There's a very real effort afoot to, 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 to circumvent uh, society and culture in, in, in major ways. But for us to pay attention to that big picture stuff, it's a waste of your time. 
I mean, it may, it may serve your own emotional you know, thought process. I wonder what this is. I, I think I could strategize or figure out what they're going to do. You can do that, but it's a waste of your time. What I would encourage you to spend time doing is spend time in the Word of God, spend time on, on identifying how you can proclaim the truth of the gospel. I'll give you this one example. I, I, I'll say this for, for, for those who love evangelism. I would spend more of my time waking up trying to figure out how over the course of a 24-hour period, I could effectively share the gospel with at least one person. Your time will be better spent there than trying to figure out what the cabal of the utopia of the eschatological <laughs> Marxian. So my challenge to you would be this week, right, as we, as we turn the page, the Lord's Day, tomorrow, think about who you're going to encounter that week and, and how many ways in which you could figure out a way to insert into the conversation a natural proclamation of the gospel. That's what I would spend my time doing. Have you guys seen the latest iteration of the gay pride flag? You know how many stripes there are in that thing now? There's like 65 stripes in that, in that, in that flag now. <laughs> I'm serious. If, you, if, you, if you'd have been on social media, I forget who tweeted it. Uh, you know, so June 1st is Pride Month. Well, matter of fact, Virgil and I have both, we have sort of taken over Pride Month ourselves. Mm -hmm. So for the entire month of June, what we're doing, and I encourage you to do this as yeah. well, if you're on social media, tweet Bible verses that have to deal with pride. That's all I've been doing. <laughs> Tweet out Bible verses that have to deal with pride and use the hashtag Pride Month 2022. Because they'll see it. Because they'll see it. They'll see it. They'll see it. I've but been doing that every day since. Been, been doing that every day. Every since day. Started that June, June 1st. Boom. So I'm, I'm, I'm tweeting out Bible verses that have to do with real sinful pride, uh, which ironically is pointing to them because your pride is incredibly sinful here that you, you, you shove your fist at God and then boasting your sinfulness. But, but yeah, the, the gay pride flag now, it's not just a gay pride flag anymore. It's, it's got like 60 stripes in that thing, and it just represents everything now. So, but, and what's going to happen is it's going to end up being a cannibalistic ideology because there's no way that all the, uh, uh, all the platforms, all the agendas that are represented in that gay pride flag will ever come to fruition. You can't. You can't satisfy everybody. They're going to find that out, and they're going to end up cannibalizing one another, and then it's just going to poof and disappear, but then the, an another movement is going to spring up. It's going to spring up in its place. Recently, Congress passed and Joe Biden signed anti-lynching legislation. Do you guys feel safer? <laughs> I, I, every time I see that silliness or the reinvention of, of the conversation or some committee, co congressional committee that's going to look at reparations. I just shake my head. It's, it's just, a, it's just a, a, another false flag for, to, to stir up emotional black folks so that they can get to the voting booth. That's the whole reason yeah. it's done. Yeah. Uh, every, every four years, of four, it's a two-year cycle for, you know, for the midterms, but they'll find some issue, some situation to stand on. The, the latest was the, the, the shooter, uh, in, uh, the Boston shooter, right? Where, where, or no, it was in Boston, it was Buffalo. Uh, the Buffalo shooter, right? He's white, he goes into a place. Well, what do they do? They fly there for the purpose of, of shining a light on the situation and say, see, this white supremacy is, is, is awful. Now, the tragedy is real. The horrific events that took the lives of the people uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the store that, that happened was real, that we should mourn that loss based upon the fact that they're image bearers of God. But to believe that, that there's this white supremacist thing that I'm worried about that causes me not to be able to go out uh, to, to, to work or to the store, that's not real. And, and, and I, would, I would argue to say that the vast majority of black people, if they're, if they're halfway sane, are going to tell you that they don't fear those things. They're, they're not afraid of those things. But po politicians <coughs> leverage those things to stir up those who are in their emotions because they recognize if they don't have the black vote, they can't win. So they must stir it up. And the way that they do that, unfortunately, is time and time again, they look for some anti-lynching law that means absolutely nothing, to, to, not, not to anyone anywhere, really, uh, and, and cause senators to have to vote for it. Because you don't want to be the guy, the white guy in particular, <laughs> that says, oh, I didn't vote in favor of the anti-lynching law. Not that it's affected anybody, but... but but, but you don't want to be that guy. So you vote in favor of it. Everybody votes in favor of it. And so they can say, see, I'm for black people. I voted for the, like, get out of here with that nonsense. Here's an additional hypocrisy to what uh, Vern is talking about. Uh, the hypocrisy of President Biden signing an anti-lynching anti law is that it was Democrats who were lynching black people. That's exactly right. <laughs> so why did you guys sign this law back in 1961, 62, 63, 64? 
Listen, every, not the, I'm, not, I'm not elevating the Republican Party as some sort of virtuous entity either. What I'm saying is I'm just presenting to you historical objective facts. Uh, the, 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 every single hurdle that black Americans have had to overcome in this country has been because of white supremacist Democrats. <coughs> slavery, Democrats wanted to keep slavery legal. After slavery was outlawed, they invented what's called the peonage system uh, in the South. Uh, it was Democrats that were behind Jim Crow. It was Democrats that were behind the Black Codes. It was Democrats behind not supporting the uh, Civil Rights Law. Democrats did not support the Voting Rights Act. Democrats did not want uh, uh, to support uh, Brown versus Board of Education. I can go back even further. The Dred Scott case in the 1850s, where you had uh, Supreme Court Justice Roger B. Taney, who, who told, who in his ruling, in his decision, uh, said that uh, black people were not equal to white people, that there was no government that a black person, that a white person, uh, or black person rather, would, uh, would, uh, would, would submit in obedience to uh, a black person and recognizing the personhood of that black, right. black person. That was a Democrat justice of the Supreme Court. I could go on and on. So the irony here is that Joe, you have Joe Biden boasting that he signed an uh, uh, anti-lynching law. When, when, it, when, when it was the Democrats party. It's, it's irrelevant today, but even but when, e it mattered. E e e when it mattered, Democrats were lynching black people left and right in the South. You see, but see, this goes back to your question about uh, uh, the point Virgil and I were making earlier about how we don't get invited into black churches. <laughs> see, we, we, because they don't want to hear stuff like this. No. They don't want to hear facts like this. Um, and and, and an additional irony is this. You have today, in 2022, more than 90% of black voters vote for the Democrat Party. Oh, yes. it, it, it's stunning. And what's, what's, what's sad about this, Virgil just said it correctly, without the black vote, Democrats cannot win. Mm -hmm. But Democrats know that they have at least nine, listen to this, this is a stunning number, nine out of every 10 black voters predictably is gonna vote for a Democrat. The Democrats know that, they've got nine out of every 10 black voters in their back pocket already. And yet it's, Virgil, it's people like Virgil and me who make up the 1% who aren't locked into that sort of uh, tribalist political mindset that we get ridiculed. So what they want, what black liberals want, they don't want the Democrats to just have 90% of black voters. They want one party to have 100%. Yes. And that they call that power. They call that influence. Mm -hmm. The Democrat Party has made beggars out of black people. Yes. They've made political beggars out of them, and they've been doing it now for almost 70 years. When you study American history, coming out of the Civil War, coming out of Reconstruction, there was a reason that the vast majority of black people voted Republicans. Yes. Because they were the ones who were, who were... They were the ones who freed them. Yes. Democrats didn't want to free black people. If it were up to Democrats, black people would still be yes, slaves yes, right yes. now. And the reason I get so animated about this is because I'm sick of people believing the lies. Yes. Mm. It's totally irrelevant. Nobody's being lynched in America today. What, what in the world... What, serve, what purpose does that law serve? Nobody's being lynched today. Well, the last black, black person who was lynched was lynched by a Democrat. <laughs> And add you, to, you have add, Biden acting like he's done something. Add, add to that, it, lynching would, resulting in someone's death is a charge of murder. So what's the need for it? Right, what's the need for it? It's redundant. It's redundant. It's like a hate crime. It's like hate crime. That's <laughs> if, as we just you, read in this book. If you're stealing from me, you hate me. Why do I have to add a hate crime? It's, the crime is, is the hatred. Hate, I mean, I'm going to add an extra five years because it was done in hate. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to add an extra five years to your sentence because you hated him as you murdered him. <laughs> All right, you, you lamented in one of your sessions, Daryl, that emojis have become a language yeah. in themselves, that this is bad. <laughs> Does that apply to clowns? <laughs> See, I have to use clowns because there's a character limit on Twitter. You only have 240 <laughs> characters to say what you have to say, so sometimes I have to use clowns. <laughs> so... All right. You said, I think it was you as well, said Obama's the most racist person that you mm -hmm. think is ever is mm -hmm. alive today, mm -hmm. that you know of. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about Colin Kaepernick. Oh, Kaepernick runs a close second. I mean, if you want to put it, put it like that. It, it's, it's amazing how when you follow, when you follow, when you follow, I follow, I follow a lot of college football. So I remember when Kaepernick was playing at Kansas State. <clears throat> totally, totally different persona and presentation of himself while he was at Kansas State. Even as he got drafted into the NFL, 
uh, by the 49ers. You know, he, paid, he put himself a... I'm sorry, was I, was I, was I wrong about that? No. Okay. It's irrelevant. Okay, yes, yeah, irrelevant. <laughs> It's, a, it's irrelevant, like that, like stick, that lynching law. Listen, stick to the relevant it's details. Still relevant right? details. <laughs> so he gets drafted, right? But then he, he doesn't make it in the NFL because he had put himself. Matter of fact, he's kind of like this. Uh, he's kind of like the parable of the uh, uh, laborers in the, in the in the vineyard in Luke chapter uh, twenty. Kaepernick thought that he deserved a place in the NFL, but now that he's out of the league, all of a sudden he's taking that personal. He's got up in his feelings and his emotions. First thing he does, what does he do? He grows an afro. That's the first sign of a problem. F- first sign of a problem right there. <laughs> you see a black person with an afro cross the street or do whatever you can. To, <laughs> to, to, he's got an afro. He, he, he grows an afro. Then he changes his personal logo to this. To this. Which is a communist symbol, by the way. This is, this is not black power. This is communism. Uh, so, 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 yeah, you've got people like him. But the irony is, is that Kaepernick right now is trying to get back into the slave plantation. He's right. trying to get back on the plantation. He, he's, now, he's, say, called the NFL, the, he's called the he, NFL the slave plantation. He called the NFL slave but plantation. But he's trying to get back but on He's it. trying to get back on the He's having tryouts with teams now and everything, trying to get back on the plantation. Now, I don't know any slave who wants off the plantation ever want it back on. Right. But Ka- Kaepernick, his visage of slavery is so capitalistic. Right. <laughs> That right. he's, he's chasing the money. Absolutely. Now, he would be the first slave that I've ever known to exist who got paid to be on the plantation. Tens of millions of dollars, by the way. To work, to be on the, to, to come That's the back. kind of slavery I'd love to be involved with. I would. <laughs> you want to pay me tens of millions of dollars? Pay? We can talk about something. We can talk. So, yeah. <laughs> so ridiculous. But it's, it's, just, it's just an example of how, in the case of Obama, Kaepernick, how your environment can shape your worldview. Yes. Uh, here you have a guy like Obama who, who grew up uh, poor, but was mentored by a guy like Saul Alinsky, who shaped his entire worldview yes. of things. And he's never let go of it. It's in his DNA now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kaepernick, the people has, that, that are around him, uh, have influenced his worldview. So the, he has now a totally different perspective on America, on white people, than he had when he was playing in front of crowds at Kansas State and then in, at the, uh, in, in the NFL with the 49ers. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, you, you, just roll it. Yeah, yeah, my bad. And, my and bad. Add, add to that, the, the family that raised him was a white family. Right. Who adopted him, loved right. him, cared for him, right. and brought him up. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, Booker T. Washington talked about how you need to be careful who you associate with. I mean, Proverbs talks about that as well. But here are two examples of people who have grown up and done incredibly well. Yeah. I tell you, it's amazing how much they hate America, but how much they benefited from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, can, you cannot go to any, put, put, put Barack Obama over in uh, Zimbabwe and see how materially well off he would be. Put him back over there. Put, put Kaepernick over in Africa while you're... With the Afro. With the Afro. Take your Afro over to Africa. Take your Afro over to Nigeria or Kenya, and we'll see how well you do. All right, I think this is our last question. The institutions, and I'm not just talking about the SBC, seem to be, you know, breathe a sigh of relief there. The institutions in our country seem to be entirely given over. So you have addressed the, I mean, we've got, we've got, We've got police departments who are doing sensitivity training yep. and racial sensitivity training yep. and adopting pronouns and every corporation, every major corporation in America, mm-hmm. every institution that we used to trust, the firefighters, the police officers, the sheriff's departments. Um, we used to defend corporations. I remember going to bat and defending um, Bill Gates and Microsoft and, and Steve Jobs and Apple and all of these years they're, ago. They're gone. The CIA, the FBI, the government, state, local, everybody seems to have adopted this. Sure. You've, you've made the comment that you see how widespread all of this is. Yes. Mm-hmm. It has infiltrated it into everything. It truly is the spirit of the age. Mm-hmm. Yes. Everything, and I do mean everything, mm-hmm. is given over to it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they have adopted it. There seems to be no, no end in sight. Mm-hmm. There seems to be no turning away from this. Mm-hmm. Can you change it? How does this end? Well, I, 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 I mean, can you stop it? Is I don't know that, that I don't know that stopping it is necessary. And and here's here's what here's what I would say. If if you think all of those organizations all of a sudden 
woke up and, and now felt like they hated black people and today now they love black people, you're fooling yourself, right? A, a lot of them have, they, they, they recognize what's happening in culture and they're jumping on a bandwagon. So they're, they're checking the box, why? Because they're, they're fearful of, the, of, of, of what would come if they didn't. There's not, a, there's not some deeper, first of all, there's not a problem with black people that they need to address so that they need to have these organizations and, and other programs within the, within the corporations. It's not necessary. There, there's not more care or more concern or more compassion now than there was uh, on, on May 19th, the day before George Floyd was killed, right? There's, there's nothing different. What they've seen is if, if they're to continue to make the majority of people happy in their mind, they check this box. Now, there are some companies that are recognizing that, that, that the pendulum is swinging backwards. For example, Netflix realized just recently that, that, that catering to the woke goals of their, of, their, of their company and their corporation is not going to be beneficial to them. So they've stood up to the wokesters and the pendulum is swinging back. Other companies and corporations are going are to come online. But this is just an ebb and flow of what they believe is beneficial for them in a financial, for, for their financial long term. Secondarily, you mentioned police officers and, and, and organizations, organizations that, we, that we know, love, and, and, and have a tendency to trust. I, I was in the military at the time at which, toward the end of uh, late 99, 2000, when, when, when there was sensitivity type training that was happening, there was diversity type training that was happening, and I knew it was garbage, and everybody who sat through it knew it was garbage. They just sat there, checked the box, and went back to doing what they were doing to begin with. So they weren't necessarily buying what was being sold, but they knew they had to check the box in order to get by. And many of them did things that way. Um, will there be people who will be influenced by uh, the, 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 the philosophy of the age? Absolutely. We're seeing that at record numbers and record pace. In fact, uh, in the area of, of this, this gender revolution, we're seeing that uh, in, in, in big ways. We're seeing young women, children who are making decisions early on to, to involve themselves in, in surgeries that are going to have an impact on their, their anatomy and their physical well-being for the rest of their lives. That, that's really, that kind of stuff is, is really scary. And those are issues that I think we need to confront in, in bigger and more vocal ways. But I would simply say that, that I see what the companies are doing. I see what the corporations are doing. It doesn't frighten me in the least. Um, they're, they're, they're riding this ideological wave. They see it has a financial advantage for them, and, and they're taking advantage of that for the season. When the pendulum swings back, they'll be the ones when it's, when it's, when it's a welcoming environment for them to, to stand up to, to wokeness, they'll, they'll do the exact same thing. And so I think we'll see an ebb and flow. I don't think things are, are over in that regard, but for the Christian, again, I think it's imperative that we're, we, we know what's happening, we're wise about it, and we stand strong with, with the word of God in, in our faith. Yeah, I like what Virgil said there at, uh, at the end. Remember, Jesus said that he's sending us out into the world to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. Okay, uh, so I think it is be a holding upon us to be as uh, informed and as educated on these issues as we possibly can be, mm -hmm. but just understand uh, that we've, what we've been reiterating the past couple of days, Christ came to save sinners. He didn't come to save society. So do not expect this world to change because it's not going to change. Um, I think we need to remember um, what Jesus, uh, Jesus himself said. He said, don't think that I came to bring peace. I didn't come to bring peace, he said. I'm so glad Jesus said this and not one of the disciples because it would be easy in this age of, uh, you know, milk toast evangelicalism to just dismiss the disciples. But Jesus said this himself. He said, I came to pit a mother against her daughter, a father against her son. And he was very explicit in mentioning those relationships. So my point here is that the truth divides people. The truth divides. Mm -hmm. The idea of unity with the church and the world is a myth. It's a myth. We talked about this in our episode on the church and culture. We talked about that. The reason Christ left us in the world was so that we would be not of the world. Um, it's totally antithetical to what he prayed in John 17 for the yes. church to try to make friends with the world. And scripture is clear. To be a friend with the world is to be and God's be enemy. God. And I don't think you want to be God's enemy. I don't think we want that. Uh, so the question is, can it be stopped? Can it be changed? Um, I, would, I, would, I would say this to that question, uh, no, but our desire should not to be to stop it or change it. Our, our goal, our objective should be uh, to be faithful to Christ 
as we serve him where he has us. Absolutely. You be faithful to Christ in your home. Be faithful to Christ in your job. Be faithful to Christ as you raise your children. Be faithful to Christ as you serve your wife, husband. Be faithful to Christ as you respect your uh, uh, husband, wife. Be faithful where God has you, using your gifts to serve him where he has you. And then trust this world, as Virgil pointed out, that God is sovereign over. Trust the rest of the world to him. Mm -hmm. You serve him where you are. Okay, you serve him where you are and let God handle everything else, uh, which he has done since the dawn of time. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that would be my comment on that. That's it. Do you have anything else you want to say to wrap up to these folks that are here? I don't want to be. Uh, Pastor. Oh, man, don't do that. Uh, just thank you. Um, I had a great time with all of you. I think we're going to be out with books or whatever out in the foyer. Um, we're gr just grateful for the time that we've had to spend with each and every one of you. It's been a joy to be here. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity. I hope it's not the last time that you have us out this way. We'd love to come back. Um, I just encourage you in the gospel, uh, encourage you in the, in, the, in the peace and the grace that is Christ uh, to continue to serve him, continue to honor him, continue to, to love him and proclaim his truth. There's a verse, a uh, Bible verse. First of all, I echo everything that Virgil said. I mean, listen, I say this with all sincerity. <laughs> Kootenai has just absolutely spoiled us. You guys have spoiled us here yeah. over this weekend. Uh, and you can tell when a congregation generally loves one another. Mm -hmm. you, you can tell you guys love one another. And what Virgil and I and Melissa have experienced is that, that the, 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 the love that you have for one another, first of all, that that love has been extended to us. Absolutely. Uh, so we're already talking about when we can come back here. Uh, <laughs> th th this place is... You, 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 all, you all have a very special church here mm -hmm. at, at Kootenai Community Church, and I don't expect you guys to say, stay this size for long at all. Word of mouth is going to get out about who you guys are, and people are going to start coming here from all over the place. I would just encourage you to continue to love one another, mm -hmm. continue to love one another, and continue to love your pastor and support him, uh, pray for him. Um, he is unique. Jim Osman is unique. He is unique and a, a courageous, bold pastor when those adjectives are being uh, uh, increasingly uh, said of fewer and fewer men yes. in the pulpit yes. uh, today. Uh, now, having said that, I would leave you with this. There's a, a Bible verse that Melissa and I use frequently in our biblical counseling. It's Luke chapter 4, verse 13. This is where Jesus has come out of the wilderness after having been tempted by the devil. Jesus obviously has withstood those temptations. And in Luke 4.13, it says that after the devil had finished those temptations, that he left Jesus alone until an opportune time. Until an opportune time. So I want to just encourage you to highlight that verse. And in your own individual walk with the Lord, just remember that Satan is always looking for an opportune time. He's always looking for an opportune time. Do not let your guard down in your marriage. Do not let your guard down in your parenting. Do not let your guard down in servicing uh, uh, one another here at the church. Do not let your guard down in your prayer life. Do not let your guard down in representing Christ on your job. However the Lord has you serving him, remember that the devil is real and that he is always looking for an opportune time to trip you up. Mm -hmm. So I want to encourage you with that in your own sanctification and walk with the Lord. All right. Just a couple of announcements as we wrap up. Um, first of all, tomorrow, Daryl is teaching an adult Sunday school class, which starts at 9.30. Virgil's going to be taking the message in the worship service at 10.45. Can I mention what I'm going to be teaching? On? Yeah, go ahead, please. So the title of my message is The Danger of Discontentment. The Danger of Discontentment. So if you're unhappy right now, you need to be in Sunday school. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you are preaching on? Ephesians, uh, Texas, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. It's a dusting over, remember? <laughs> dusting over of that text, and we're going we're gonna to talk about true biblical reconciliation. So. Good. All right, now, if you are here from another church uh, in our area, we, those are going to be live streamed and recorded, so you can pick those up later. We would never encourage somebody to leave their church and, and come here for that, because we like to have other churches that are involved in the conference 
It's not necessarily going to be on the subject that we our conference is on, so though yours is kind of uh, related to it, you're not going to miss anything if you stay with your home church, so we want to encourage you that way. Uh, but if you have traveled here and you're staying here for the weekend, and of course we welcome you to join us tomorrow morning for our worship service. Um, Daryl and as soon as, as soon as I close in prayer, Daryl and Virgil are going to go out in the foyer and stand out there by the table to sign books, to take pictures, anything else that you want to do with them while we clean up in here. And I would just ask um, Kootenai folk, if you don't mind, helping us stack the chairs. There are two types of chairs. There's the light gray chairs with the dark frames and the dark gray chairs with the light frames. If you are shade blind well, you or You got black and white blind, chairs here, Jim? What's that? You got black and white chairs? Is that what you're <laughs> Is that what I just heard? Yeah. We're very... <laughs> In the interest of diversity, inclusion. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So we want to keep those separate because they go in separate parts of the sanctuary. So please just stack them and leave them. Separate we're gonna... parts of the sanctuary. Yeah. Jim, you're going downhill, bro. As you... <laughs> we must keep the chairs segregated. segregated. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. So, you're welcome, Jim. That went south. That, uh... Fast. Yeah, did. Uh, so we're going to do that. We're going to wrap up the tables and uh, just leave the chair stacked where they're at. We're not going to set them up tonight. We'll get some folks to do that tomorrow morning. And lastly, there is some food on the table at the back, leftover food. If you want to take some of that, some bags of cheese and there's some meat and lettuce and some things like that that are left over, and a little donation can if you want to give to the cost of that, you can uh, back there as well. Let's give a thank you to these two men. Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we are very grateful for the time we've had this weekend, for all that we have learned, the ways that our souls and our spirits and our minds have been refreshed and educated, equipped, and encouraged together. We're thankful for the love that we share in Christ, for the reconciliation that Christ has done on the cross in bringing us to you and us to each other. Thank you for these blessings, the richness of the gospel, and we pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us to stand in every place that you have placed us and to be faithful in all that we do for the sake and for the glory of Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, you are dismissed.